Good morning, uh, colleagues and students. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Namdi is in? Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Namdi, for joining us. Um, I think I'm, I'm going to leave it over to you for the moment. All right. Good morning, colleagues. Um, good morning, Ludwig. Good morning, students. Good morning, alumni and practitioners. Um, this has been a great occasion um, for the School of Architecture and Planning. A crowning period in a moment of challenge. A difficult year wherein we have all learned to adjust. I recall very well that the last major event in person that happened here at school in, was the Bugatman exhibition, which many colleagues, students, and perhaps who were here attended. What this pandemic has done is present an opportunity to say how resilient we are or life can be despite the current conditions. So this lecture will be presented by my colleague um, Ludwig Hansen, who has generously devoted his time to organize these sequences and series of lectures. This is the 14th uh, lecture in the BAS Honors Lecture um, series. And it started with a number of key scholars um, and presenters and um, uh, practitioners, including, but not limited to, Jessica Thompson, P.A. Swanepo, Vedant uh, Maharaj, um, Hanin Rasmus, Petty Majoroli, um, Craig McLenaghan, um, Andrew Marken, Kate Orton, Eltworld Architects, um, Cohen Gasson Architects, Henry Comrie, uh, Neil Schuf, um, Nisha van der Hoven, and finally today we have um, Ludwig Hansen. And please <coughs> excuse me if I have omitted any person, please do include, we send our own good wishes. We have all learned and heard collectively. My hope is that after the lecture, Ludwig will through with all the presenters to see how we go forward with what we have learned and to make the most of it. Once again, we hope that in the next academic year that you will join us as we build through this medium, as we share knowledge in the school, as we develop um, collectivity and projects of decisions that affect Johannesburg, that affect our community, that affect our country. Without much ado, I would like to appreciate and thank all of you for participating and to thank Ludwig for putting this series together. Please welcome Ludwig Hansen. <laughs> Over to you, Ludwig. Thanks, Nandi. That's um, more, most generous. Thank you for your introductions. Yes, colleagues, um, students, uh, guests, uh, welcome to our 14th and last in our lecture series, uh, which is both a note of thank. Thanks to all who have participated. Um, it also is a brief synopsis of the insightful talks delivered by the 13 speakers who have so generously um, afforded their times and insights. It will also include a cursory reflection of my own on the design methodologies and principles in architecture based on the insights, insights offered uh, by the 13 speakers. I've been privileged to host the lecture series with uh, Kiki Derman, Nkulisi Makube, and Anton Vessels. Um, the lecture series forms part as Namdi has mentioned, of the um, Honours Architectural Design Programme here at the Bit School of Architecture and Planning. And the Honours Programme, in essence, aims to enable our students to attain a level of confidence uh, to address challenges in the 
highly demanding uh, built environment. Students are encouraged uh, to demonstrate their combined knowledge base of architectural design, theory, functional planning, technical development, um, environmental responsiveness, um, graphic skills and writing abilities gained over the last four years with increasing levels of sophistication and independence. The broader aim um, of the course traditionally via the studio environment um, is to equip students with the skills to engage and explore spatial challenges by way of drawings, diagrams and sketches. Now, teaching and engaging with students has become exceedingly difficult and challenging during the COVID-19 pandemic, which has made traditional studio interaction impossible. We've been forced to inquiring a whole host of new skills and technologies to stimulate or simulate rather the um, studio environment to enable students with design methodologies and spatial pr um, problem solving skills. Upon investigating the number of ICT platforms available to students, or available on the market at least, uh, we, we used a package called Miro, which allows for students to display their work uh, in large groups uh, for crits and input by multiple uh, tutors and supervisors. And it also allows students to draw as one would in a studio environment. It allows students to see the work of their peers, give input and evaluate their own progress. Um, I'm, briefly, um, I'm, I'm, I'm briefly sharing some of the work of the students that have been submitted over the last uh, couple of weeks. And the focus of these lecture series is part of that academic program. And what it was to, it was aimed to expand the discourse on architecture and the built environment in the context of some dramatic changes within our local context. The translation and sharing with students the complexity of creating meaningful place relevant spatial interventions and projects that inspire requires a comprehensive approach to design with all its associated conceptual and technical requirements. Interior and exterior social environments are also key ingredients and act as an important informant to enable um, interactions relating to the functional aspects of the building. Through the studio process, the theoretical discourse and these public lectures are called upon to direct sensitivity, imagination, intellect and increasing levels of professional judgment, judgment towards enabling students to design a coherent environment. Apart from changes to our, our studio um, teaching methodology, the COVID-19 pandemic has also had a positive result, or many positive results. And as we were able to gain access to diverse speakers, academics and practitioners, previously not possible due to either geographic and time constraints, being able to assemble the displayed panel of speakers is a, is a result of these changes. Every single one of the speakers also offered their time and efforts with a great sense of purpose. Willingly participate in any question. Their commitment to architecture and their contribution to the development of the architectural discourse is a greatly appreciated by all of us here at WITS. And most of you also have been part of the school as lecturers, design tutors, and examiners, and we trust we'll be able to host you again at the school in the near future, probably under better conditions. The venture into, more, uh, into a more public forum has been insightful and uh, experience for many of us at WITS. The lecture series have, been, ha have had about between 240 and 280 attendees per lecture, resulting in over 3,400 subscribers over 2,200 registered for CPD accreditation, resulting in some frustrations and also angry emails for late delivery of certificates. The primary focus of the lecture series was the students though, enabling their academic progress with a secondary aim to introduce a broader discussion with our professions, profession and our peers. I'm not always sure if the multiple guests joining each session did so for ease of CPD accreditation or out of true curiosity and drive to grow as designs. I trust it is the latter. 
Also, the n number of queries for their certificates is understandable, but the sheer amount of participants has made the issuing of these an unforeseen administrative challenge, something we are working quite hard at. The lectures have given us insight on the methodologies and approaches towards solving spatial challenges, as well as the nature of exchange of ideas to achieve architectural and spatial excellence. All the speakers have demonstrated um, an understanding of the processes towards achieving design and architectural excellence, which have been insightful and instructive to students and peers alike. We've extracted some of these wisdoms shared during these talks, and we will, through the synopsis, provide some observations on the processes followed by the 13 speakers and practitioners. We've also attracted, um, or I, I've extracted images from the various lectures to demonstrate the synopsis, and we have referenced them as best we could. If some oversight or inconsistencies appear, towards correct uh, accreditation, yeah, they do solely, I'm duly to blame if they are incorrect. Uh, the purpose of the lecture series was also to establish a better understanding of design methods applied by architects and built environment specialists. The act of designing in architecture is a complex process and not easily taught. Many designers, when probed for reasons to explain their actions are either unable to answer questions or provide explanations that are not true descriptions to their actions. Frequently, the designer will answer that his or her reason for making a particular design decision is feeling or intuition. Under this model, the design process assumes a near mystical aura. Architectural designers can create, yet are often unable to say how they do this. Often, that which can be explicitly discussed by the designer is the least significant part of the design process. Frequently, uh, the designer will answer that his or <coughs> sorry. Frequently, the designer will answer that his or her reason for making a particular design decision um, is based on. Oh, sorry, I'm repeating myself. <laughs> Obvious throughout the lectures was that all keenly displayed an understanding of their own selected role in architecture by following a belief of self-explored manifestos. Most of the more senior practitioners uh, shared with us their well-established and distinct position towards the architectural expression, whilst the younger were on a clear track in their journey towards manifesting their position towards architecture. The setting of a manifesto really actually falls within the modern because it denotes and underscores our renunciation of the recent past, our favoring of a new beginning, interpreting historical perceptions, a process of rationalization, something processional, especially expressed through tensions and dynamics. A number of broad positions were manifested during the course of the talks, and they not all fall clearly under one heading. The perspectives shared range from position of greater social consciousness, urbanist awareness of phenomenological sensibilities, environmental consciousness, activist positions, drawing our attention to disenfranchisement, or from the position of the assembly and making of architecture. It was clear from all speakers that they took and or presented a stand from a particular kind of time consciousness which defines their understanding of the present, which is continuously reevaluated and then recreated. It probably also stems from our current cultural condition that seemingly demands as absolute necessity the need for constant innovation as a primary fact of life, work and thought. Positioning oneself, taking a stand, setting a manifesto is inherently utopian. It is to name the ideal within our ability the attempt to leap from the despondence of present conditions with the promise of a better tomorrow. It is both real and ideal, naive, visionary, public, yet in many cases very deeply personal. All speakers have sought a design approach that aspires and aims to enhance the performance of space making, translate and visualize um, principles and concepts that transcend the normative. 
The 30 lectures uh, form an essential part of the students' academic growth, allowing them insight into the design methodologies of successful architectural and design practitioners. The assembly of the talks into a coherent synopsis of design methodologies is part of the academic output for the year. We should not forget that the lecture series' primary focus is the expansion of the student's understanding of design. It also is not a summary or purely a rehash of the lectures, but an interpretation and synopsis of the shared knowledge into a framework to support the students and broaden the academic discourse on the subject of design methods. When following the discussion over the last couple of months and also after re-listening to the recordings of the various lectures, certain reoccurring topics, perspectives and positions could be deduced. We've collated them under six broad headings, which include the notion of collaboration, the importance of the narrative, and creating a sense of meaning in our architecture, the significance of placemaking, <coughs> and the aim to establish place-bound and place-relevant spatial interventions, the value of making assembly and craftsmanship, the urgency for sustainability of greater socio and environmental consciousness, and the insight of being custodians for future generations and acknowledging, acknowledging our memories. The six topics are supported by a number of sub-themes which underscore and support them. But more importantly, the topics should be viewed as a matrix. All the topics are interrelated and cross-support each other and do not stand in opposition to each other. In highlighting the selected topics and themes, we try to emphasize the integrated nature of the architectural design methodology requiring sensitive and or sensible application and consideration of multiple facets of, and dimensions. As first topic, and one that was most prevalent uh, among all speakers, is the importance of collaboration. Collaboration with colleagues, end users, contractors, manufacturers, stakeholders, stakeholder groups rather, and varying client bodies was deemed as key to the successful completion of projects of varying scale and influence. But of all of these stakeholders, the group most excluded and disenfranchised in the design process is the end user group, who are too often required to accept their homes and living conditions established without their participation. The process of architecture, and even more so when we attempt to build and improve our cities today, has become so institutionalized, technical and specialized, that people seldom have an outlet to put their own intuition to use anymore. It is increasingly pertinent that we find avenues whilst planning and designing to integrate the people that use them into the decision-making and design-making process. Integrating people previously never involved or having a say in how a building should evolve or respond to their requirements should be the overriding principle in the design process. The talks also highlighted the belief that we grow to learn who we are chiefly through contact with others. Members of the project and stakeholder teams hold the collective personality of the whole. With sustained connections and continued conversations, participants, regardless of degree of inclusion, develop emotional bonds, intellectual pathways, and better abilities to problem solving. Successive and sustained exchange with stakeholders, peers, and clients help to remove tensions, enabling um, creative avenues that otherwise would have stayed impossible. Radical and participatory planning and design approaches were key features of the talks, or underlying feature of the talks. And a variety of methods of architectural design were developed through an equitable um, participatory process. Design and planning methodologies that aim to harmonize views among broader participants always resulted in improved design results, in addition to creating a broader sense of ownership and those involved in the implementation of the architecture. Key towards the understanding of architecture is that the making of places and spaces should enable the broadest possible spectrum of people. Architecture, as well as in urban design interventions, are ultimately for and about people. And as designers, we should at all times emphasize the value and significance of place 
which is best achieved through the broadest possible collaboration. Ways and means were also shared how to integrate and benefit the end user, who in many cases is unemployed or unskilled in the process. A variety of schemes, for example, by simplifying assembly processes or the introduction of an artwork program integrated into, uh, uh, into the architecture was shared with us. These expanded programs of collaboration all had the most positive results, creating a fantastic sense of ownership, as well as adding a further layer of personalization, allowing a rather allowing or rather creating multiple avenues of involvement only improves the resultant architecture by adding a further personal dimension not possible by the architect or designer on his or her own. The architecture thus became a palette expressing the people it houses or accommodates. The attempt at broader participation and, and seeing the architecture as an enabler, I'd like to think has been very successful and from a personal perspective, definitely a satisfying and an enriching process. In all the talks, it was clear that architecture ought to have an underlying narrative that embodies the sense of space, makes it experiential and meaningful. The, the psychological dimension of architecture is addressed by spatial narratives, making the design approach more humanistic. The discipline of the narrative in architecture was connected to a myriad of allied and different domains throughout the talks, as drawings, sketches, diagrams, filmmaking, photography, digital media art, art, historical events, and a myriad of other applications were used. A key takeaway was the discussion by Mpeti on rituals and narrative architecture, where rituals are characterized by sequences of activities in, in a concealed place and are based on archetypical actions based on culture or lifestyle. The presentations highlighted and introduced narrative concepts around animism, uh, the significance of body architecture and an architecture that is a manifestation of our own intuitions and feelings and that explores sequential association and articulation of space as an expression of ritual which forms the order of life. All the talks had the sketch and drawing as fundamental narrative tool. And a key component of this design of, of their design methodologies. The understanding that drawing and, and narrative are intrinsically related was displayed in the continuous reflection of the speakers. It is clear that the sketch and drawing are an indispensable means of communication between the designers and the contractors, stakeholders, um, client groups and peers. They are also basic record, records of the creative idea and have a significant influence on the aesthetic value of the designed object. Proficiency at drawing and using it as a medium of communication plays a particularly important role in the architect's work with the free art drawing as a tool for correcting the whole design process and plays a fundamental role in architecture since it is the first expression of an architect's vision. Le Corbusier, <clears throat> as exponent of the versatile architect, painter and sculptor, emphasized the promin prominence of drawing and painting in the process of architectural design. He believed the architect to be, be someone who combines the attitude of an artist with the utility of an engineer. The architectural projects, exhibitions, landscape designs and installations all stem from original ideas first put down on paper or possibly in some cases an iPad as a sketch. Sketches and drawings clearly ensured full freedom and were expression of an emerging concept and examples of an ideal image acting as a reference until the project's eventual implementation. Nowadays, we, when thinking about architecture, it seems that this is dominated by computer software and the architect's hand no longer interferes at the design stage between a vision and a create, created reality. A look at the drawings by the various speakers again provides the enduring evidence that sketching plays a crucial role in the design 
methodology, and I hope that students will take note of the aesthetic satisfaction of sketching and the opportunity it offers to reflect on the role it has on the designer's conceptual narrative and purpose. The sketches alone in the 13 lecture series are worthy of far deeper reflection and digestion. Many of the sketches shared are, are, are thought-provoking, a summation of so many ideas and concepts, stimulating a variety of new postulations and opinions. It is also worth noting that the projects shared have to a great extent been marked by the, the desire for originality. They, they project <coughs> the projects aim to set new trends and devise new strategies of action. Most of these were presented in the form um, of drawings, particularly in the initial stages of the project. Thus, apart from material built architecture, there is non-constructed architecture, an architecture which might never be built, but which exists in the form of drawings. The old adage still holds true that the term work of architecture should be ascribed not only to build objects, but also to those that exist in the form of drawings. Underlying to all projects and discussions on architecture are two intellectual themes. An architecture and design that is place appropriate or place bound, and the importance of place and space making. Starting on the larger or urban scale, the importance of common and shared space cannot be overstated. Neither its ability to enable its citizens to achieve their individual goals and dreams I'm of the opinion <coughs> that the public realm in our cities and the space of our architecture respond to has two primary roles. Firstly, it's the dwelling place of our civic life. And secondly, it's a physical manifestation of the common good. When we degrade the public realm, we automatically degrade the quality of our civic life and what our society stands for. The quality of our built environment and the ability to create spaces which are worth caring about comes from a culture of civic design, a body of knowledge, method and skill utilized over centuries, which too many architects and planners over the years have thrown away because they thought we don't need it anymore. Consequently, we have seen the result all around us. We have created an environment where the emphasis moved from the shared to the private. We have ensured that a greater part of our architecture and civic spaces are not worth caring about. We have created streets, squares and buildings not worth looking after. The emphasis and principle I took from these talks, and I want to press on you as well, is that we have a responsibility to create spaces and architecture worth caring for. So what makes good civic and public architecture? <clears throat> what ensures the sense of place? To quote uh, Kunstler, it is primarily, primarily dependent on our ability to define space by employing the vocabulary, syntaxes, rhythms and patterns of architecture. This is our job as architects and a responsibility we cannot remove ourselves from. For too long, our architecture and developments have con consciously removed themselves from the public edge. And if the long-term sustainability of our cities are to be assured, our spatial principles have to change dramatically. The narcissist position taken by architects and planners has to shift towards the shared and common, towards a greater sensory awareness of our broader built environment. This, this aim to create memorable space, a sense of place, a place worth caring for is so imp important, I think, not only because it informs us where we are geographically, but also where we are in our culture, where we come from, what kind of people we are, and it affords us a glimpse to where we are going. And most importantly, it allows us to dwell in a very hopeful present. Placemaking and spacemaking are opposite sides of the same coin. It was also instructive in the, also very instructive in the lectures how the ability to define memorable space through the use of light, shadow, materiality, textures, and craftsmanship is central in all the projects shared. The architectural designs shared during the talks all go beyond simply being statements of architecture, but have evolved to be more places for people to come together where connected spaces create an experience 
and the speakers all constantly aimed to elevate the experience of the user. Critical also was the ability to create adaptable and flexible spaces that best support the activity of the buildings it is meant to host. By carving spaces out of mass, dividing the space using various tools of geometry, color, and shapes. The next topic deals with sustainability. I say sustainability in the broadest possible sense. The future is largely unknown. Therefore, it is the responsibility of the present generation of design work, designers to use the available resources in a way that meets their needs without compromising the ability for future generations. Because, because of its nature, the construction industry is a huge consumer of natural resources, which are limited and irreplaceable. All speakers highlighted, highlighted the wasteful processes in our making of architecture, the unconsidered application and use of materials and technologies foreign to their context. Projects shared aim to deliver product, uh, excuse me, products that enhance life, life's quality, achieve customer satisfaction, provide flexible and adaptable user um, uh, support users, support desirable natural and social environments, as well as maximize the efficient use of our resources. So it was made evident that it is crucial to stop the depletion of our natural capital through creating innovative solutions that achieve the objectives of present and future generations. As the entity that designs buildings and specifies materials, architects have to accept their leadership and social responsibilities in this regard. The social dimension of sustainability received equal attention, focus on the health and safety of workers, enhancing the participation of communities in the design and development and, make, and, and the making processes, and maximizing benefits to disadvantaged groups. The enabling dimension of design and building was again seen as fundamental, and it was keenly demonstrated that even the smallest interventions could act as catalysts for wide-ranging and wide reaching impact. Touching our environment lightly, limiting our footprint by exploring alternative construction methodologies and assembly processes were highlighted. Possible mechanisms of building in areas not, un, not only of a sensitive environmental beauty, but also mechanisms that act as enablers to building in remote circumstances, isolated from conventional construction methodologies were demonstrated. Underlying in, underlying in the design of all the projects displayed during these talks was the emphasis on the manufacturing and assembly process of their architecture and projects. Craftsmanship is not just simple, simply an act of making. It embodies a much broader concept that involves going beyond industrialization and developing an understanding of tools and materials as precious resources to be carefully employed rather than exploited. We were reminded that we cannot ignore or push aside the relationship between materials in the process. The dependencies on utilizing and expanding the local abilities, the consideration of its renewable nature is key, is, is a key aspect of craftsmanship in our design and eventually in the making of our projects. Speakers demonstrated that crafted production of buildings play a key role towards architectural space making. Both craftsmanship and architectural design rely heavily on tacit forms of knowledge, skills and experience in addition to a communicable knowledge where the transfer of knowledge from the architect towards the craftspeople is crucial for the successful implementation of architectural concepts. The craftsman's ethos was a central point. As Richard Sennett's definition states, craftsmanship names means an enduring basic human impulse, the desire to do a job well for its own sake. This ethos as a responsibility assumed by the architects as craftsperson in their project cannot be overstated.
Not only is the continuous search for innovative assembly and improved quality reliant on the designer, but also the ability of the designer to transfer and share with multiple others that assisted with the construction of these projects. The role of the architect is more than design and documenting. It involves the transfer of knowledge and the enabling of responsibility to many, many others. This I trust. And this aspect is not lost uh, on our students and peers alike. The last of the topics dwells on how architecture captures, captures past and present memory within a very specific context. The projects presented in the talks displayed a spatial imagery and creative architectural design which attempts to make sense of the world and, and its impact on our senses of reasoning. We were reminded that our architecture is a reflection of the society we live in and our design approaches are impacted on by received traditions and the continuing legacy of collective memory passed on from one generation to the other. The greatest number, number of memories come back to us when other pe people recall them to us. We were reminded whilst buildings stand, buildings stand about as motionless, as, as a motionless type society, while not speaking, we never, nevertheless interpret their meaning and our collective memory is based on space, spatial images. The force of local traditions, narratives transmitted over generations, and constant reading of the physical context environment becomes a powerful basis for imitations and its translation in space and form making in architecture. Architectural space and form making fulfill other functions. They create beauty, harmony, order and balance and involve problems of selection, organization and a great deal of visual thinking to grasp the essential traits. Architecture has to offer a sense of well-being, representing a world congenial to human needs in a clear, comprehensive and coherent statement. The terms of reference for the Arctic depends on a number of contextual, historical and environmental considerations. The memory embedded in these references find their way into the projects presented during the talks that form an important translation of our underlying understanding of our current world. The intelligence of the architects becomes apparent in the depth of meaning conveyed by his or her design. The shapes of any architectural design are nothing but the designer's way of seeing the effects <coughs> of actions and forces on his or her plans. In most of the presentations, the architectural design tendency is towards simple structure founded within the rules of mathematical geometries, such as, such as the square, square, rectangle or triangle, and whose geometrical shapes follow the same law of nature which presses for balance, order and regular shapes and forms. This is the essence of the relation between the conception of the mind and the reference in nature, references in nature. The striving for increased efficiency of material cost and space were also underlying to most speakers. Embedded in the design approach is a constant striving towards improved value add, resulting in an architecture stripped of pastiche applications and the narrow stylistic oriented style definitions we see so much of in our built environment. The projects displayed and I hope demands from all of us a more serious attention to how we design develop and make our architecture. The speakers all demanded a greater focus and a level of seriousness towards the design of space and our built environment, as we too often forget the impact the simplistic repetition of normative solutions have on our cities and built environment. Many of the speakers um, are and were involved with projects at universities and have a keen understanding of the educational architecture and its impact. Apart from exploring the nature of design methodology, a secondary aim of the lecture series was to expose or explore rather the nature of learning and information exchange in these sort of conditions brought about by COVID-19, with a more specific focus possibly on the higher education architecture. Our universities, as well as all other educational institutions had to change and rethink how we engage with scholars. 
Universities, for a large part, have been at the forefront of these changes and offer some insights how a cities and broader community could also adopt and rethink conventional exchange. Over the last decade, I've been fortunate to be involved in the development of a number of university campuses, both in the overall spatial design as well as with the architectural development, including the new universities in Kimberley and Nelspruit. In, sh in sharing some of the experiences, I've selected a couple of photographs of Solplaiki University and the University of Mpumalanga to celebrate their fifth or their first five years of growth and development. The photographic record is a project I completed with Graham Williams, who is a photographer known for both his photojournalism during the transition to democracy and his documentary projects in post-apartheid with focus on South African society, as well as the documenting of the personal life of individuals of this country. Currently, there are a number of key debates and questions in the development of universities and educational buildings and the infrastructure. Firstly, what is the nature of the future university in South Africa in terms of its spatial form and structure in relation to the academic and developmental prerogative? Secondly, does the scarcity of resources to fund the expanding needs of universities require greater collaboration with other stakeholders, for example, through partnerships between universities and their host cities or communities? Thirdly, what form should the provision of student housing take to maximize the, the advance of the academic mission? And lastly, what and how do we address teaching and research in a dispersed environment due to due to the pandemic and the role and possible impact of the fourth industrial revolution on our education processes. Over the last 10 years, I've been fortunate to visit and advise most of the 26 universities in South Africa and the 94 campuses. Observation from these visits and studies included that the only certainty about university is uncertainty. Robustness and flexibility in their spatial campus framework and its academic architecture to accommodate ever-changing needs or academic needs as well as student life is an essential part of that. As highlighted also by the speakers, collaboration is key. Planning, design and construction has become so institutionalized that technical professionals have captured the process, process making participations by non-professionals and academics very difficult. Greater collaboration with host cities and communities become increasingly essential to ensure a longer term sustainability. Universities across the board are increasingly required to provide for their own bulk services, electricity, water and the like, as their host cities cannot guarantee these services. Collaboration also means that universities should share their knowledge resources with their hosts. Museums, exhibitions, public lectures, public outreach foyers need to be promoted. Campuses are essentially finely tuned ecologies. <coughs> they, they are not unlike small towns. They reflect all dimensions of life, teaching, learning, research, recreation, sport, housing, ceremonies, social life, which all should be reflected in our architectural response. Their architecture and campus layouts reflect the characteristics of their social historical context and natural landscape. Many institutions, not unlike our cities, have expansive land holdings, and what happens far too often is the wasteful nature of an, our approach towards land, which is mostly wasteful. The, planning, the central planning and design question is not where to build architecture, but where it should not be allowed. The introduction also of everywhere, everywhere learning as a constant has become key. Informal learning is an important is as important as formal education processes. Places of, of informal meeting, the shared spaces, are of paramount, paramount importance. Learning and teaching should be accommodated everywhere rather than restricted to the lecture hall. Together with everywhere learning is the idea of lifelong learning. All universities are hugely inefficient in the use of spaces, infrastructure and architecture. In comprehensive studies of university space issues, we found that the efficiency rate in space use is less than 40%, and this is and probably an optimistic number. One tool to improve usage is to 
introducing lifelong learning as a strategy. The university then becomes a place for learning and growth for a broader spectrum of people and a broader spectrum of age groups. As is the case with our cities, private vehicular movement is dominant, adversely affecting the quality of our learning spaces. I found that most academics are more interested in their parking space than the academic output. To make campuses more equitable, conditions for non-motorized transport, universal access and pedestrian movement has to be promoted. Lastly, residences play an increasingly important educational role. They are central to student life. They are, are or rather should be places of learning, teaching, exchange, and not just dormitory units with specific bed counts. COVID-19 has made this even more evident as many of our students do not have suitable learning conditions in their own homes. The, the mentioned observations can be summarized in seven future gazing principles which, which I've collected and can provide a framework going forward. These include community connected education to improve lifelong learning, quality of student life as an essential component towards personal growth, creating interconnected collaborative spaces as well as robust interchangeable spaces, the expansion of education in the field as an extension of business and manufacturing, improved technologies to ensure anywhere and everywhere learning, and introduce spaces for specialized and focused study. The brief, sorry. the brief synopsis of both the future of our universities and exchange to methodologies of design covered during the 13 lectures provided insight from a variety of perspectives. Key was how these projects displayed and demanded from all of us a more serious attention to how we design, develop, and make our architecture, which all impacts our shared future. The speakers all demanded a greater focus, a level of seriousness towards the design of architecture and our built environment, as we too often forget the impact these formative solutions can have. As a concluding remark, I trust that all the students, colleagues and guests have benefited from the lecture series and I trust we will deliver the same again next year. Also, I would like to thank Patricia Teron, Anita Zentesi, Stephen Bloomberg and Veronica Fisher at WITS for their kind assistance with the talks and general arrangements. Also, a word of thanks to Lionel, Jessica, at my, in my office for the input at my, uh, during the, the talks. And lastly, again, a word of gratitude and thanks to all the speakers who have so graciously shared with us their knowledge and insights. It is greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Well, I think that was the concluding uh, remark on all of this. Uh, I don't know if there are any questions that you, someone might want to raise as a as a final query and answer session. Ludwig, uh, it's Kate here. Oh, it's okay. Um, hi. So, uh, I mean, first of all, congratulations on a fantastic series. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think we've all really enjoyed it. And um, it's always interesting to participate in something that's got a kind of bigger and sort of more collective view, which I think has been very interesting. And I think that you've done a fantastic summary of it. So thank you very much for that. Um, Thanks. Really, mine is a thank you. And then to say... Um, the series is available online, is that correct? And how do we access it? Correct. Uh, so the aim now is to collate this uh, into, we just edit the videos slightly um, and uh, then trying to put them online on the VITS website. Uh, in the, I think it's a YouTube format. Or, and I think that's, that's the next step. So all 13 or 14 lectures should be available uh, within a month, we hope. I think this is also a, quite a learning curve in terms of the size of some of these um, uh, recordings. 
Um, so I think we, it's, it's um, I think a bit of, people can just be a bit more patient on that one because I think we might still have some problems with, with the uploading. But in general, I think it's, it's, it's going to be there from November onwards. Muted. Thank you, Ludwig. Congratulations again. Thanks. Thanks, Kate. Any any other queries? Um, can I ask any questions around? Right, so I, 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 if there are no further questions, I think um, I'm going to close the, the 14 weeks, uh, 14 series again with a thanks. Namdi, I don't know if you wanted to maybe make a conclusion or something like that, just to send us on our way. Is Namdi around? Hmm. He might, he might be multitasking. <laughs> there he is. Oh, he's got his mask. <laughs> uh, are you muted, Namdi? Namdi, you're muted. Thank you very much um, for the lecture and uh, for presenting to us the achievements of the year and a clear diagnostic analysis of what university campuses, the challenges we face. Um, if you were to, if I may, if you were to um, indicate, uh, you've indicated the informal student study spaces and then continued education environment. Um, anything that's jump out at you as to how we will tackle this in particular in one of the campuses you know the best, VITS, what should we be putting in place? What should we be doing? And I hope it's okay that I may ask that question before over to you. Yeah, I think it is a valid question when we look at our university designs and how they've been laid out. They've become increasingly isolated um, islands within either the community or the cities that, uh, that host them, um, which results in a way that they, there's very really little in engagement between the city uh, and the university. And I think that has, is to the detriment of both parties. So the relationship between university uh, and city is, is key. So it also is that there's a certain knowledge economy in, in embedded which is not utilized and not shared from the university. And I think that needs to be exposed as much as possible. And these have spatial implications. We need to look at avenues and means that we can share with our cities. I think WITS to a certain degree has been trying that over the last 10 years by moving all its public interventions or public amenities to the edges of the institution. So that's where the WITS Art Museum comes on board, which I think was discussed during the, uh, was also part of the lecture series. Um, as well as we've got something like 13 museums, uh, a very, very high quality museums that all um, need to be part of the university's outreach. Outreach also means um, that, uh, that we engage with a broader spectrum of students. And this is where the idea of lifelong learning becomes an important part of how we deal with uh, education. Universities um, are currently seen as just a further transition after secondary school into sort of after high school and then into university. And the student component is generally quite a young one, up to 25. That has to change dramatically. We have to offer a much broader um, uh, uh, offering to our city and be engaged with it. Our universities are hugely inefficient as it is, as I mentioned in the talk. But outreach also means that we have to understand where our students are living. We might have to start doing amenities outside our universities, 
for students to access for research or uh, support, especially in the COVID pandemic, a lot of students have fallen on the wayside um, because of it. And I think because of their own home conditions not being suitable for, for learning and uh, proper exchange. And that brings again this, this notion of the university residences on board, that residences are not for those that live necessarily afar, but those that don't have the conditions to do a proper academic research or get a receive an education. So there must be some changes on that score going forward, and those are things that we've been investigating. That's a bit of a broad sweep. Very good. Thank you very much. Right. Thanks, Namdi, for hosting. And then yes. um, thanks to all my friends and colleagues as well. Any other questions from colleagues? Any other? All right. Um, once again, this is a very lovely and a fruitful year. Uh, I want to thank all our colleagues. Um, Ludwig, thank you for the lecture. We look forward to seeing you um, in 2021. Keep safe, and this continued education series will, uh, you will be updated when the next series will come out. Thank you, and bye-bye. Thank you, Ludwig. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.